Welcome to Go Figure. My name is Nadeem Makarin, CEO and founder of Gojek, Southeast Asia's first super app. Gojek does ride hailing, food delivery, payments, even on-demand massages. You name it, we do it. Go Figure is a podcast dedicated to expose the inner workings of ambitious tech companies in the emerging world. We like to talk about things we like and talk about things we don't like. There are a lot of myths out there that we want to dispel, so keeping it real is kind of our mantra. Hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, welcome to Go Figure. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. for being here. Um, today we're going to talk about product market fit yeah. and how to scale products and some of the pitfalls in product execution. Yeah. Right. So um, it's one of the most important topics I think for us. But first, before I'd like to uh, introduce, we've got Niranjan here, our CTO of Gojek Core. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And we have Akash over here, one of our heads of product, uh, who has led multiple products all the way from food to merchant promotions platform yep. to a variety of different things. Yes. We've all been here from the beginning, since the, the dark days uh, <laughs> of Gojek when, when there were only three tiles, right? Yep. Yes. There is only ride, ride on a bike, send me something and food. buy me something. No, not even food. Yeah, not food, food came actually. later. Yeah, food yes, came later. Yes. It was just like even buy me launched. something, right? So why does this why is this topic even important? Why is product market fit even important? I think that I'll, I'll kick this off and say that uh, there are so many biases and pitfalls in what we think people need versus what they actually do that you know, many people, even with the greatest intuitions, can make some of the most damaging mistakes when yes. thinking about product. Yes. Yep. And, and so let's talk about that a little bit. And let's talk about, um, Akash, you had a framework in mind with which how to think about uh, esc uh, growing products or, or, or um, actually uh, scaling up a product. Yeah, it's a, it's a very simple framework. Uh, almost you can think of it as a growth loops when you are starting a new product a product is nothing but you are imagining a particular need of a customer being served by what you are building mm. uh, but you first need to validate that that need exists and that need exists for a large enough number of people uh, to be relevant in the market and finding that fit, what's called product market fit, is absolutely critical and that has to be the first step of any product development. Because if you don't get that right, you are effectively trying to optimize a wrong solution, right? Hmm. So that's the first phase. The so get the, get the problem defined as accurately as possible. And also find a solution. solution. So I cannot tell you how many startups I have I've coached, mentored, or seen that jumps straight to the solution. You yeah. see, like that's basically the, the default mode, right? We have done yeah. that in the yeah. past. We have definitely <laughs> done that in the past and that's why I recognize it. It's like, oh, I have this great new solution that does this, 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 and like slow down. Yep. What is the problem you're addressing, right? Yeah. Yep. Do you, do you, so what, what is it about founders or, or, or entrepreneurs or leaders or managers in tech companies that have that natural instinct to jump to the solution? What's causing that? Because that's the exciting part, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's where they have fun. Uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, in a way, that's what people consider as running the business or doing any work is, mm. is that you have come up with a solution. And it's not just related to the tech company founders. I mean, we all do that in our lives. We try to solve things which may not even exist. We try to prioritize things in our life which are in wrong priority. I mean, it's just human nature. It is reflected in the product managers or product company space because it is so fuzzy. That's right. You can always lie to yourself if you don't have data or large enough number of people to validate it. Like when you're working in a financial market, you can't lie about what's a profit or a loss. Mm. When you are working in a technology space, either your code works or it doesn't. But if I'm saying that, hey, have I found product market fit? Or is this the right solution? It's just my judgment. Right? And, and therein lies the 
com- complication of having debates about product market fit yeah. without having data yes. and without having something out there with which to triangulate yep. your data. And to extend your point, right? This problem is so core to a lot of people. That's one of the reasons our first company value, right? It's not about you. Yeah, it's not about you. Because people, uh, you know, there's there so many biases that you have, uh, yep. specifically confirmation bias about yep. your pre-existing beliefs that you want it to be true so bad that you will ignore counter, um, intelligence basically right yep. data that reveals the opposite of what you yep. say and and I, I have a perfect example of this like in, in the beginning when we first launched uh, mm. we, 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 we didn't have uh, we didn't have food yet right mm. we only had ride courier and uh, concierge service uh, shop uh, in the beginning and only on motorcycles mm. and basically I remember this meeting with Sequoia um, uh, who are our early investors uh, but this is pre-investment, and the meeting very quickly turned out to be a debate. Okay. Mm-hmm. And basically, the debate was, I was so convinced that Gojek was going to be a primarily a courier and logistics arm, mm-hmm. right? And that was going to be the biggest thing, and that we would be serving businesses. <laughs> Literally, that was, that was, that was the initial, cause, because you know why? Because before the app launch, that was the core of our business. That's yep. the people who saw value in a pre-app Gojek we're businesses that needed to send stuff around, yep. right? So I thought we were a courier business. Um, <laughs> very quickly down that debate, you know, I think what 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 Sequoia helped mentor uh, me on that is that you know look into the data and find out you know what are actually bigger problems of the user that you're addressing. And it very quickly came out that when we looked at the shopping data or mm. the personal concierge data, they were about eighty percent food. And that was the moment I lost the argument, right? I, I couldn't dispute that data. And, and, and at, at, when I realized that, I'm like, okay, okay. We're a transport and a, also a food delivery company first and foremost, yep. right? Because that's, that addresses the bigger problem. That's a beautiful thing to have. And I really love Go Shop for that one reason, um, apart from a lot of others, but it's one particular reason. I see that as a Petri dish of products, right? I know, uh, yeah. It, yep. It just says that, hey, this has a slightly higher um, user experience friction to use because, you know. Wait, for the users that don't know, GoShop is our personal concierge service. That's just a fancy way of saying, I can tell a driver to go buy me something anywhere. Now, I I basically tell a driver that go to this particular location. I don't specify whether it's a shop, it's a mall, or whatever it is. And I have a text box where I say that I want you to do this and I think it's gonna cost this much amount of money which I will pay you. And that's it. That's it. That's it. It's just yeah, a it's task. It's so open-ended, right? So open-ended. And it became the the fountain of ideas and confirmations because yeah. if you create a generic service like that, then really interesting things come out. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I like, just going back to the product market fit part, uh, not every business can afford to have something like this or the you know, have the ecosystem. But for Gojek, this worked very well because now you can actually look at the Go Shops data to find product market fit for new businesses. That's right. It's so beautiful. And Go Food is now really depending on on Go Shop yeah. to to field new restaurants that per- perhaps weren't listed, yes. but reflects the demand there, yeah. or perhaps uh, uh, restaurants whose visibility was hard to find yes. for that user. And we add that to the. We person. actually got that feedback, so we started looking at the Go Shop data and found a certain set of restaurants being constantly uh, ordered from there, and then we discovered that somehow our search did not really cater to those restaurants well because there were mistakes in the setup, uh, the search was not per- working properly, the ranking was somehow stood up, and we just kept looking at that data and correcting, improving the go food experience, mm. right? It, it's just it's just a signal, mm. right? And you need to look out for the signal whether you have something like go shop or not. Not every company can afford to have or is lucky to have that particular set of signal. But then you look for signals somewhere else. You look for signals in competitors. You look for signals in uh, internet, in any different tools that people are using. Mm. You look for signals in real life what people are doing, right? What kind of hardships they go through. That's where you find the 
need that's where you find the problem and you need to validate that that is the real problem that you're trying to address and it's not some hypothetical that maybe you and five of your friends care about and nobody else cares about right yeah. and and so there's kind of two ways of going about starting a product fit assessment no. on one end of the spectrum is you go and spend months doing research even before ever launching anything yes. validate research etc like that then there is the other side of the spectrum which is let's get something out with no research no. and see what happens yes. and then start yep. collecting data now is either way right or wrong well in product development there is no right and wrong <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't help me akash um, so it's a, it's what, what a you're nuance. What, what you're optimizing for is to find product market fit as early as you can, as economically as you can, and with a high degree of confidence, right? You are optimizing for time, cost, and your confidence that product market fit really exists. That's what you're optimizing for. Now, uh, what you need is you need early adopters for finding product market fit because someone has to use it. Mm. Um, you need to identify the right problem, come up with the solution, and see that without throwing money to get the growth, it's exploding. That's what happened with coaching. No, but, but before that, are you are you saying that you mentioned get something out there? So, is there? Do you think there's any value in doing research without having something out there to sure. to bounce your assumptions from? Meaning some kind of an MVP, so, right? Some right. kind of a, a minimum viable product. So it completely depends on what is the cost of building that something is. Right. Right. Building something like GoShop, it's very cheap. Mm. But let's say you're building a phone. Because it's simple. Yeah. Because it's a simple service. Yeah. Okay. But let's say you're building a phone. Mm. Now building phone is, you have to put in a lot of research, a lot of time, effort, and optimizations mm. before you can get a product out. A prototype out. A prototype mm. out. So you're optimizing for cost. You're look constantly looking for what is the lowest fidelity tool. Okay. Which I can essentially take this thing to market and start talking to customers. Because you are looking for data. Yes. Right? And hence, uh, even the kind of research you do has different <coughs> steps, right? There is There are qualitative surveys. Uh, after that, you can essentially do a quick design and just show them paper mockups saying that hey look at these paper mocks and tell me whether it makes sense for you or not or you can build a dummy prototype which partially works mm. uh, or you can build a full fledged product now on one side there is cost of building on the other side the number of customers you can approach also keeps increasing like if you have a dump working product and prototype the number of customers you can reach is going to be far larger and hence, statistical significance of your data is going to be far more meaningful, giving you larger, higher confidence. Yes. Versus if you want to do group studies, you can do it with 10 people, 100 people. Mm. So, am I correct to assume that if the problem you are trying to address requires a simpler solution, generally speaking, the better way would be to experiment quickly and fast yes. and get something out yes. there? Yep. But if the problem that you are targeting has a far more complex and high investment solution, yes. that is where you put some more upfront, non-expensive uh, uh, research yeah. uh, in the beginning. Yep. So I, I want to add one more nuance there. Um, it also depends on your ability to acquire customers. Just because you build something doesn't mean that you will be able to get customers on board. So uh, and. In B2C space, that doesn't matter as much, but in B2B space, that's a really, really critical aspect. You are not going to build something and just hope random people will use it and give you feedback. You still need to seed that particular ecosystem. The second part is, in case of Gojek, whether it's GoShop or uh, GoRide, it's a, it's a very common human need where you are the user. There are very few products where any, any person can get up and say that I am the user. That's right. right. And, and everybody uses transportation. Everybody right? uses transportation, yep. right? You have to travel. That's that's not optional. So in those situations, you can leverage intuition exactly. much. You don't like much at faster. that point investing yep. heavily into research is just stupid. Right. It's just waste of. Why resources. do I need to prove that people need to go from A to B really exactly. quickly? 
Now right. going to the right. other extreme, even if building something is really cheap, but you are not the domain expert, you are not the most common user, you are not surrounded in that ecosystem, very likely you are going to be wrong in whatever solution you come up with. So even if prototyping or even if coming up with that one solution was easy, there are going to be 100 hypotheses that you will come up with out of which one is going to be right. right. And if you try to prove those by building software, it's just too expensive. You actually might want to go there, do research, validate some basic hypothesis, understand the problem space better, and then build those cheaper solutions. So where you just release maybe five iterations and find it in five iteration. Right. So, so it's you, a complex ecosystem. You, you, you experienced this yourself, right? When yes. you were building the merchant promotions platform. We, yes. For the audience that doesn't know, Gojek has a, a, a really large uh, a set of tools yep. for merchants to grow on yes. our platform. Uh, merchants define, uh, what we mean by merchants is restaurants yes. uh, for, for GoFood and our food delivery platform. And so you've never run a restaurant. Nope. Right? Never. <laughs> you've never owned one. You don't know what it's like to operate it. I do not it. empathize with that customer segment at all. Right, so how did you overcome that problem? Did um, you just guess in the dark? So I think it was three critical components there. One is you can look at, um, a parallel ecosystem, something like Merchant Promotions Platform did not exist in Indonesia. So I can't look at for the local competition to validate whether the problem space exists or not. But I can actually look at places like China where the overall food delivery ecosystem or the food ecosystem is much more mature. Okay. So I you're looking at comparables elsewhere. Comparable universes elsewhere where the similar dynamics of profitable business, food delivery, customers, data being available, as long as these underlying components exist, there are not too many variables in how they interact with each other. Right. So you can actually study that and draw parallels. That is one. The second thing is, um, then you once you have that and you say, hmm, this actually makes sense and you have some value proposition that you can go and pitch to local merchants, you go and start talking to different, different merchants. So here it's important that you are able to segment your merchants by their own incentives mm -hmm. and their understanding. Um, That's in so the restaurant business, you have uh, the large, uh, you have the large uh, McDonald's, Pizza Hut, KFC, Domino's, these players. Uh, you have boutique restaurants which are not very heavy on delivery. Uh, they actually want higher footfall uh, because these are fine dining restaurants. Mm. Then you have these smaller stalls which really, really want as high traffic as possible because their cost of producing food is very low. Mm. Right. Now these are different, and just, just these three random different segments, there are far more actually. But you pick up these segments which are relevant where their need for growing business and the way they look at that problem is going to change. You go and talk to them and you try to run your idea past saying that, hey, I will make this available to you for free. Would you use it? What's your problem? And that's how you start finding more data. That's what we did. Once we had a decent understanding of the ecosystem, our customers, we developed something and then launched it to those 10 people. Uh, that's where we also used our research as a way of doing lead gen. Mm. So your research is not necessarily just research, specifically in a B2B space, your research almost always will convert into your alpha customers. Okay. Has to. So I, I have this natural, intuitively in my experience, having conversations with people always inevitably leads to more important insights about yeah, yeah. the problems themselves. Absolutely. And maybe it's because we're fundamentally dealing with human problems. Yes. And therefore, a language is the best way to actually unearth nuance yep. and to find out the why. Yes. Right? Yes. You had a point before about the difference between qualitative and quantitative data. Um, how do you see the balance between them? Because there's some diehard people who believe that Man, uh, you know, having conversations with people, you, that's it's definitely statistically insignificant, hmm. right? It's very hard to justify how having conversations with the people are, are, are statistically significant. They are knee deep in confirmation bias. You yep. could ask leading questions during yes. that uh, interview process. But at the same time, for me, the first ever conversation the first ever data point that I got to inspire myself to start Gojek hmm. was pretty much 10 to 15 conversations with normal motorcycle taxi drivers that 
I took home from work. <laughs> and based on those 10 to 15 conversations, I made the decision with the other co-founders to let's do this. Let's start Gojek. Mm. Yep. Right. So how do, I, how do I reconcile that? That's called confirmation bias. <laughs> <laughs> so this probably is. It's, it's partly confirmation bias, but more importantly, it's what you said earlier, right? Which is you are the user as well. Yes. Because finally what your objective is to have that confidence that what I am thinking is right and hence I'm going to double down on it, invest in it and take it to the larger market. Mm. If that confidence can be built by talking to 10 people, awesome. If it cannot, then you need to talk to 100 people. So to, to take that to extreme, right? Um, when we look at the human needs and let's sort of stretch the Maslow's hierarchy further down, uh, survival is a very basic need. Let's assume that you are living in a war zone. Uh, you don't have to worry, do customer research whether you need to sell arms or not. It's, true. it's obvious. It's obvious. Yep. Uh, food, whether the, there is a need to sell, make food available or not, mm. that's very really obvious. You go up this particular hierarchy, you don't need to do an extremely high quality qualitative research to find these things. But as those needs become sparse and sparse and sparse, for example, if you're figuring out whether you're going to come up with an application which helps people learn philosophy, you better do a lot of customer research <laughs> to understand whether that need actually exists or so not. So where you are in the Maslow hierarchy of needs One actually determines the amount yeah. of research. But yeah. I also I also have I mean if you look if you look at most founder stories, hmm. they are littered with stories like mine. Yeah. Whereby something happened to them. Yeah. They got curious, talked to a few people and then say, Wow, this is a real problem. Yeah. And let's do it. And I want to offer a bit of a of an explanation for why low number of samples hmm. may be as powerful, if not in some cases more powerful, of an indicator of a problem. Hmm. Okay, sure. so uh, let me highlight why. So, for example, uh, remember when we used to have these? Uh, I used to have WhatsApp groups uh, uh, with uh, with drivers yep. and some merchants, etc. And, and uh, I would also have, you know, my f because Gojek, everyone in my family, my friends, and everyone uses Gojek, they all complain to me yep. <laughs> whenever something goes wrong, right? So if I get two or three complaints about a particular bad experience yep. that is related to the system, yes. like some kind of a bug or system yes. breakdown, if I get two or three separate complaints on that day by my immediate friends, yes. I can already roughly calculate, like within the, a very large or, range, yes. the error rate of how many users are experiencing this error. Yes. Okay? Yeah. So there's also this interesting thing that if the probability of you encountering that issue with just a few people is you're hitting it again and again and again, it's a big problem. Yes. So, right. uh, okay, let, let's define this space. Uh, to take away from the qualitative versus quantitative aspect, right? Uh, both type of study is critical because the quantitative aspect will always tell you what's happening and in what proportion it's happening. Mm. It can never tell you why it is happening. Yes, the right? why is never there. The why is never there. It will never be there. You, in qualitative aspect, you never get the statistical rigor. So you don't really know in what proportion this is happening. And you are getting the opinions of people as to why they think they do what they do. The reason I'm making such a vague statement of why they think what they do is in B2B space, the businessmen really think about their business. Mm. Sure, the quality of how much thought they pro uh, put into it might differ. But it's certainly far more than how people think of their quality of commute can be improved. Right. So, but you have the qualitative and the quantitative. So the way you want to use both of these is, let's assume that you hear these three complaints about a particular bug or particular issue on the system. Best way to deal with that is go back to the quantitative analysis. See, hey, this is the particular problem. What is the signal that I can find in my data to understand what proportion of the overall user base is facing this particular problem, yeah. experiences this problem. So do use this as a signal, 
but you cannot really have a final competition of how big a problem this is mm. treat that as a signal and that is all it is right. don't ignore uh, it specifically when it comes to friends and family right it becomes really really interesting because they are going to be most critical yes so what they the data that you get from them obviously they are going to be like you know even a smallest thing they are going to raise yes some other customer might not even talk about it yeah yeah so that 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 information definitely has high value yeah because they are within your proximity yes they're more open to share it yeah. yes and you know they're just they love to annoy you yeah right exactly yes. and you know there is this kind of epic issue in all kinds of product fit analysis of correlation versus causation this is not restricted to product market fit uh, yeah. assessments this is true with all scientific findings yes. in yep. in the modern world um uh, it's fundamental there's, a, to science. <laughs> there's a huge debate in medicine around what we thought was causative but turned mm. out to be correlative so this is an epic scientific debate of all time right and what i've discovered personally as a founder is that you absolutely need qualitative and quantitative but qualitative research has far more insight into causation but yes. can but it it's very difficult to quantify the size yes of that issue or yep. problem quantitative data defined in product market fit as getting your product out there and then seeing how users interact with it or large kind of rigid surveys etc for me is the is the opposite hmm. they are extremely statistically significant you can you can identify the magnitude of the problem but it tells you very little about the causation yes and the impact on the impact yes you just know it happened you don't know what happened after that you don't know what caused it yeah but but qualitative m- goes much closer to the root cause of a problem so so as your product scales up you know the importance of qualitative in the beginning is ext- is an extreme high hmm. and then as it scales up quantitative data catches up and then you have to just maintain the balance of each so what happens now in our product teams i mean just to illustrate what audience uh, go what we do is we usually identify issues through the quantitative data yes yeah. right we see there's something here this is really interesting i don't know why it's happening now the instinct and these are smart people instincts okay the instinct of smart people is to immediately associate oh obviously that's why yeah. yes yeah? i have been the worst actor in this in the early history of gojek <laughs> yep because i i thought you know because in in many ways my intuition yeah. was correct yeah. so i just kept thinking i would get it right again and again and again and again right if you get a few things right you just Absolutely. assume you're going to be right forever right yes. yep. um and I began to notice that as our product scaled and as complexity increased my rate of intuition accuracy went down. Yes. Yeah. So I remember uh, early days of Gojek right uh, after Gokar launch it's like oh go ride orders are going up and Gokar orders sorry Gokar orders are going up and go ride orders are going down it's raining. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we were right more often than not that's right I, i knew i knew exactly when i was like, i knew when it's hard rain or light rain oh the curved shape is like this <laughs> therefore it's raining only in some parts right yes oh and then oh look look how bcr dropped definitely flooding we have flooding guys <laughs> i can tell <laughs> you know and it was impressive for a while until until it stopped until it stopped <laughs> right until it became too big and, and that's the yeah. thing that's that instinct uh of of I'm not talking about dumb people but of, of very competent people all over the organization it's a natural human instinct to jump to that solution it really boils yeah. down to discipline i mean uh or every, process same thing man following, if we relied following, pro- following process takes discipline if we relied mm-hmm. on discipline personal yeah. discipline of everyone in gojek we'd be screwed by now because how much how much can you depend on just personal discipline as opposed to process or oh no what what i mean by, what, I, what, culture, I mean by right? what i mean by discipline 
was that whenever you have the first instinct uh, don't jump to the conclusion follow a certain process be patient look for more signals look for more markers and then decide yes. the discipline of following the process yes. it's the, the pause i call it yes, the pause, pause. Yes. right it's uh it's the same pause that you have to do um just when you're about to like fight with someone hmm. maybe a family member or your spouse right there is this already this almost like your lizard brain about to <laughs> jump and like yell or say something you'll regret later on and the key is just to pause yeah. what hmm. notice that it's happening and then reassess right that's yeah. the most important thing and when you see some data and it's like so exciting right and you don't have that moment of pause and say all right I think it's this. There's a hypothesis. That's okay. It's my hypothesis. I'll do. Now I need to go and ask some people <laughs> and do the qualitative stuff, yeah. right? Or launch my research team to actually validate whether that hypothesis so what, was so true. So what you initially mentioned about the qualitative versus quantitative analysis, I think they both have the same pitfalls. Uh, even in qualitative analysis, just because you are getting the why's immediately answered by people, doesn't mean that they are right mm. right people like it's a very common thing apart from the leading surveys the like leading questions this and that people have a tendency to please the interviewers people have a tendency to appear smart in the interviews people have tendency to just make things up uh, i mean a lot of literature available not just about this but even around uh, police interrogations like not interrogation but uh, police interviews of um uh, eyewitnesses right talk that if you are friendly to the eyewitness you tend to get a lot more incorrect information because you know they just want to ensure that you get something so they will make things up yeah whereas if you are very professional and you are little stern you will get little information but they will be accurate about the information that is such a subtle things to get right and honestly i'm not that good with people so i tend to depend on the data side but these are the problems of the qualitative aspect so over there although you are starting with why it can still be wrong similarly when you are starting on the quantitative analysis sure you don't have you there is a higher probability of you getting the correlations wrong but at least you can then start looking for different 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 signals to support your hypothesis yes. the best way is always to have both quantitative and qualitative analysis that agree with each other the the most accurate decisions you can ever make is to have a quantitative analysis i mean you can start from either way but both the analysis need to agree on what is happening in what proportion what is the impact of it and why it might be happening because even the why part you can find in data when someone says that oh if i don't get the ride in 30 seconds you know what i just go do something else you can find the correlation in the data. Right. So, so Actually, try to marry the quantitative and the qualitative part. That is when you know that you are not fooling yourself. So, data is risky in a way, right? Yeah, you give same data to two, two t- statisticians, they would come up with completely two different conclusions, and argue about it, and they would be confident because they can say that data proves this. Yeah. This is not me. This yeah. is data. It's like a it's like a <laughs> whitewash, right? Yes. It's, it's like a blanket statement. This is data. Yeah. yeah. I cannot tell you or the audience enough how many times data has lied to me. Yeah. I like it happens even more so than humans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? And that's why the cleanliness of the data and the the sanity and the scientific nature of by how you perceive you it that. Yeah. is so important. And that's why one of our core values is be a scientist, right? Be a scientist. What does that mean? That basically means just be a skeptic. Yeah. Right? just be an intense skeptic just be methodical just be skeptic be and informed be informed and and keep iterating and validating what you know now i want to introduce this other concept of of when when a lot of product marketers or product growth specialists uh, or product managers are in the growth mode right let's say you've discovered product fit and or or you think you've discovered product fit but from day 0 you're already subsidizing that product with promos discounts yeah. all kinds of incentives yes. into that program like this is 
you know, and it's very hard because in high growth companies, etc., your natural instinct is always to promote things, especially if you've raised funding, right? Yeah. What are you going to do? And you're, you're optimizing for growth. You're not optimizing for product market fit instinctively. Yeah, you, you, well, you got to spend the money. You just raised a bunch of money. Where are you yeah. going to spend it on? You're going to spend it on to grow your product, right? Yeah, Makes, no, nobody ever sees that growth is bad, right? <laughs> yeah, growth can never be bad, right? Growth is the end goal, the end being of, of, of what we're all doing. Yeah. But is it? So the problem is when you bring exogenous incentives into the equation, that brings noise to yes. your data. And noise to the extent that will create over excitement, potentially, almost all the time. like. It's over a, excitement it's noise. yeah it, it, when it's noise it's yeah. the money that's causing that product to grow instead of inherent product market fit yeah so yeah. how do you how do you balance that how do you balance the fact that you know we need to grow our products but at the same time running experiments in a subsidy or promotions rich environment almost negates your data in, in a very convoluted way. I mean, if, if I can be very simplistic, I would say that do not use subsidy when you are trying to find product market fit, mm. right? Because if you are using subsidy to find product market fit, it's equivalent to saying that, hey, I have this particular coffee, I want you to drink it, and I'm gonna pay you to drink it. Mm. I cannot really say it's a good coffee because 100 people are drinking it. Right. Right, so, I mean, that's really bad. Like, you can never, you should never really do that. You use money for growth to get new customers to try the product, uh, to actually deal with some shortcomings of the product. Because mm. any product in the MVP stage, when you're just proved your product market fit, of course it's not a polished product. So there are friction points. You pay people to overcome those friction points and still adopt the product in a way, but not really for product market fit. So if you want to determine the product market fit of this cup of coffee, yeah. first, you can't give the coffee for free. The coffee for free. Yeah, you got you got to charge the same amount as an average. Any other coffee. Any other coffee. Yes. And say, hey, you know, try my coffee. Hopefully, if you get someone to try it, first yeah. of all, then they try it. Oh, okay. Give me another. Exactly. Okay. That's product market fit. That thing repeated again and again give me, is product give me market more, fit. They're calling their friends that this is amazing coffee. I mean. We, we have started a new coffee shop on fifth floor over here. Uh, I just learned about it today before yesterday and they have something called Cocochino, mm. which is like a coffee with coconut milk. Uh, Dito show, like put, pulled me over there and said like, hey, you know, why don't you try this coffee? Right. After that, I took Sidhu over there. Why don't you try this coffee? We had right. this guy coming in for an interview and we just went out for lunch just before I came here. I'm like, hey, you like coffee. Why don't you go and try that one? That's right. That's product market fit. That's right. And that's why NPS scores are a very powerful signal uh, or net net promoter score uh, for those uh, for the audience that doesn't know what net promoter score. It's your it's a score that determines your propensity to uh, speak highly yeah. of uh, a product to your friend or family. Like or of all the users around. that you have, how many are going to promote it versus how many are going to detract? detract. So, and the extreme case of this, right, is. Oh, I'm running out of coffee beans, so I'm going to increase the price of this coffee. Mm. And still people are coming. Yep. Yes. And we had that in Gojek in the early days. That's right. Yeah. When we hit real product fit, we were yeah. we, we couldn't handle demand so much that we increased price to try to taper demand down. And yet we were still under uh, uh, full utilization. Yeah. Right? And that's Actually, when you know you've hit great so product it, market. It fit. is even beyond that, right? Like I remember seeing this where uh, we essentially increased the price in the morning rush hour and people started going to office early. Yes. They changed their behavior. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we identified that, you know, it, it, it initially the early adopters were using our motorcycle taxi service for, for two main reasons. One, the fact that it eliminated the problem of anxiety of getting a ride before yes. they didn't know if they were going to get one. The second part was reducing the the hassle of negotiating the fee. Yes. And that fee. And that was such a big market fit that in, in a period of rising price or even time-based <laughs> pricing, we didn't have surge pricing then, we just, yes. we had like for this time, make the price higher, right? Um, that people would change their behavior and leave earlier 
yep. just to catch <laughs> that, that promo. So that's what happens when you have powerful product market fit. Yes. There is a, a, some signaling of price insensitivity. There is no initial product. There's a high NPS, the virality uh, 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 factor is high. And that's when you know that you are on the brink of market creation. Yes. Right? Yep. There's, there's one thing in trying to substitute some behavior. Uh, so for example, before we thought the only people that would take Gojek Go Ride is um, our motorcycle ride hailing is people who already took motorcycle ride hailing before. It was not ride hailing, motorcycle taxis before. They just yep. did it manually without an app and without professionalized drivers. Yes. Turns out today, you know, the vast majority of people who are who are taking uh, Gojek had never taken yeah. uh, motorcycle taxis before, right? Yes. And that's where you and the, and the vast, uh, by far, the vast majority of people who use GoFood are people that never use a food delivery service before yeah. because yeah. the market was just so much small. That's what happens. That's what. That's the action or the mechanism that is taking shape when you will then expect a five to six e six x increase in the market itself because of your product, this which is, happened. To like us. This particular aspect uh, is so beautiful, uh, especially in today's day. And this is not so much about product or go check as such. The world itself is going through changes where constantly people are creating new markets. Mm. They are creating new behaviors. And your analysis of whether that particular behavior will stick or not, or whether this particular product will, like what is the TAM of this particular market cannot be studied based on the current showcased behavior. Mm. You now have to actually go one level deeper and look at what are the motivating factors. What are the market forces which are driving something? And then extrapolate that if you reduce this particular friction, what would the TAM be? So with the constantly changing ecosystems and technology making earlier impossible possible, your analysis of TAM is fundamentally changing. Mm. It's no longer looking at competitors and saying that, oh, all these people together, this is what happens. Like now when we look at uh, ride-hailing markets, like the way I think about it is the population that is there, the congestion levels that are there, the GDP that is there, look at what the current mode of transportation is because you're like hey this is so amazing that I know for a fact that when I put this service over there it has to work as long as these supporting factors exist and those supporting factors are not competition yes and I guess that's that's the most powerful signal but kind of going back going back about the point about money hmm. and about subsidy and spending how how do we how does one actually reconcile when it's the right time to spend for something? So let's go back to the coffee right, analogy right, right for a second. Right time to spend uh, to find product market fit? Yes. So let's take the coffee example. Hmm. Okay. If I sip it, I bought it at normal price, I raise sure. the price, I buy, I've discovered uh, product market fit. Yeah. Now let's say it's not coffee anymore. Yes. Hmm. Let's say it is a new cognitive improvement power drink. Sure. Okay, it is yep. a power drink that improves your memory, yep. and you have to drink it every day for it to have Some clinical effect. effect. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I'm just making this up in case you haven't. <laughs> sure. I, although I would like that. Okay. So what's different about this product? If I just charge the same amount as a cup of coffee for that product, yes, and say want to buy it I mean if you're asking me I would say like screw you like that's that's <laughs> that's the most ridiculous assertion I don't believe you first of all yeah. that it is I don't know what's in it I yeah. feel unsafe yeah. about it I've never had this kind of drink before yeah no way okay yep. now when your product requires a significant amount of change in consumer behavior if that decision point and hurdle is so much bigger instead of something mundane that you do, which is having coffee every day, yeah. that's where promotional incentives absolutely are a lot more important in the beginning. Definitely. Right? The, the yeah. amount of behavior you want to change in your consumer 
is always in proportion to the incentives you have to give and the incentives are not always monetary so which is why i just call it incentive rather than money or promotions right uh, the incentive can be social pressure the incentive can be uh, some sort of a status the incentive can be how good they feel about themselves you can use any incentives that you want uh, money of course is the most explicit that you can use and which is why it's easy yeah uh, really it's the fastest it's the fastest yes. right it, it's it, it's a hack it's raw yeah <laughs> it's raw uh, but yes, the amount of behavior change you want in people is going to be proportional to the uh, incentives that you have to provide. So for example, when you are doing ride hailing, uh, people are still traveling. Mm. It's not that they choose to travel or not to travel depending on your subsidies. Mm. Right? So, uh, which is why in the early days of Gojek, even if you raised prices, they were still using it. Mm. Right? Uh, but take Gopi for example. Now we are trying to convert a cash rich economy, a cash heavy economy into a digital economy. Mm. We are asking people to change the way they behave on a daily basis and build up habits. It's one thing to ask them to change it for one day. It's another to ask them to build habits, right? Yes. Like the study shows that building habit takes 18 months of constant uh, activity. Mm -hmm. That's when sort of the habit goes somewhere in the deeper part of your brain where it's just your second nature. Uh, to ask someone to change how they live for 18 months of their life is not going to be cheap. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. Uh, although it creates another question at that point that if you're going to pay me to do something, how do you know you have found product market fit? That's right. And different behaviors have different, what we call the, the, the threshold or the aha moment. Yeah. Um, for, for, for example, food could be like X amount of times in a month builds habit yes. for X number of months. Yes. Yep. For uh, go car, it could be uh, uh, X number of trips or X percentage of trips yeah. in a month that you take this, then it develops habit. Yeah. Right. This is how you. Every single product has different aha moments by which habit is built, and then it becomes a a learned behavior yes. and then a mm -hmm. dependency mm -hmm. and yeah. in some and in some form of ways it, it could go to the extreme side which is a little bit negative which is addiction <laughs> right <laughs> that's that's something that we need to call yes. out explicitly <laughs> yeah uh, right and so so uh, there is a the best product managers are constantly trying to triangulate or isolate those aha moments yes. at one point how far do I need to incentivize this person before I can turn off the gas? Yeah. Yes. And, and, and lock that user in. Yeah. Right? You know, one of the most beautiful things we've noticed is a, a Gojek as a super app has this aha moment called the golden triangle. Yeah. yeah. Whereby as soon as people, uh, a user uses three different services yeah. in a month uh, and they're on GoPay, they're pretty much our user for life. Yes. Yeah. They don't go anywhere. It becomes their home base. Yes. Right, and this is a, a, a really interesting phenomenon that can that is revealed through uh, product analysis, revealed through user behavior, revealed through data, but then informs the entire spending strategy of the organization yes. that you're in. Yep. So product market fit is not just the principles and frameworks and and skepticism that you need to to analyze the data are not just important for product managers product marketers, etc. It's extremely important for the entire identity and goal of the company itself. Yeah. Your, your OKRs should really reflect which state your product is in. Yes. If not, you're doing something really wrong. Going back to the uh, product market fit plus subsidy angle, right? Uh, one way of identifying whether you have found a product market fit in a subsidy rich environment is to actually reduce the subsidies. Uh, you may not want to do that for the whole market and that's where the experimentation comes in so select your segments very carefully but if you are able to reduce subsidies over there and see what the change in behavior is is the change in behavior proportional to the reduction in subsidies yes. is a very good signal to tell you if the habits are being built or not and although you can't afford to fully take it down in the face of competition probably yes right? Uh, but yeah, you, you still need to make sure if you don't do that, you are in a world of trouble. But I, you know, there are so many <laughs> cases that I've heard of people in, 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 sometimes in Gojek, but not as often, but in a lot of other companies 
whereby there is such a huge psychological fear of taking down subsidies to see mm. and to assess um, that that people just continue the lie. That's <laughs> they keep <laughs> they me, keep continuing. I mean, the lie. I, There's I, like I, I don't want to go out of this dream. That 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 is equivalent to me not wanting to go to a doctor for a checkup because I'm not sure what exactly. my blood pressure is going to that's, be, that's and I just perfect, avoid to no. find it out. I, I rest my case. <laughs> they don't want to know the truth, right? And, yeah, and, yeah. And, and the less secure product managers will consistently create reasons What's and excuses. What's important? I mean, do you want growth or do you want truth? Well, that's hard. That's about that's about be- becoming a scientist. But a high performing company culture should encourage those kinds of breaks yes. on spend yes. to be able to cross check: Is this spend retentive? Yes. Are these users actually using it again? Right without a financial incentive and without an ingrained culture that doesn't reprimand the product teams for the drop in growth, but yeah. already expecting it and celebrate it as a good thing. Okay, yes. great, now we know. Yeah. Now we know what's real and what's not. Yep. And in this crazy roller coaster of raise money, burn money uh, game that is played in, in, in high uh, growth tech companies today yeah. in, in the emerging world and, and in the developed world. Uh, so the same, it's, it, it takes a lot of courage to kind of institutionalize that experimenting with subsidy, right? Yeah. Yes. And, and telling everyone, it's okay. Yeah. We know your numbers are gonna drop. Like how many times have we actually comforted teams and saying, hey, it's okay. If yeah. it crashes, both from a spend or even from a reliability perspective. Yes. You know, it's okay. If the system goes down, we have backups, etc. It's okay. We need to know. Yes. Right? So, so Same thing with spending. You touched on something very interesting, which I don't think a lot of people realize. And it took me a while to realize that. Uh, when you add subsidy to the mix, sure, the company is a very different beast and your expenses are very large. And then because of that, you need to be a lot more agile in how you manage things. That's all that is fine. But really the impact that it has in the way product manager thinks of his product fundamentally changes in compared to a non-subsidy product. Yes. It is not just How? one more dimension that being added, it skews everything. Because it's noise. It's not adding a dimension, it's adding noise. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, we, we have been talking about actually that. I just want to call out explicitly that dealing with a subsidy uh, product, subsidized products, versus non-subsidized products, the product manager's job is literally order of magnitude more difficult because of how difficult it is to find out truth. Mm. If I'm not paying my customers, everything that my customers do is much more honest in a way, right? If I use that terminology. Uh, The market feedback to me is much more organic because I am literally executing the business as if it's a sustainable business from day one. Whereas if I'm not doing that, if I'm actually spending subsidies, everything has a lot of noise, the market signals are skewed, uh, we not only have to get to neutral, we have to figure out how to be profitable. Many a times, the product that is that you are subsidizing is not really the one that is going to make you money, you are actually going to build out something else. It's a very complex beast to build. It is not equal to any other product. Yeah, because long-term reality is those subsidies are going to go away. Yep. Yes. It has to be a sustainable business. Yes. yes. So how do you keep optimizing or building your business for three, four years without removing subsidies? At the same time, you need to know that you are course correcting in a direction of sustainability. What's ironic is that the further away you are from the truth, the easier it is to get all the glory. Yeah, yeah. To believe right? that winning. To believe so that many winning. startups we know have failed on yeah. this fundamental thing, right? Like they were able to show growth, they were able to raise money, but as money dried out, they had nothing to show. To yeah. call out nuance, it is similar to how a lot of startups spend uh, for customer acquisition in the early days uh, using just you know spending on marketing. I mean, s- spending subsidy for per transaction is the most extreme form of marketing spend for acquisition. Yes. Right? It's extreme. It's like orders of magnitude more extreme. But yeah, it's the same problem. Effectively. Let's go let's go back to that framework, right? So we had the identify product market fit. Yes. Then grow the product. Yes. When you've when you establish this, 
go spend some money. So, so let's assume that we have right? found a product market fit. Yeah. Like the people are like addicted to your product. Yeah, they just it's really good. NPS is high. Yes. Then you spend a bunch of money to let people know about your product. Yes. Okay, and convert people into your but, product. But like then the tricky part is like how do you really spend? Because many a times you are going to find product market fit on a smaller segment of the market. Mm. Right. Like let's assume that you get uh, 10,000 users to really be loyal customers of Gojek and those people come from different different backgrounds, right? Different economic stratas. Uh, I think that's really good to know that that is product market fit. But now you want to expand, now you want to capture rest 99% of the business or the market and that is what we call the growth phase. That's right and and this is the tricky part, like in GoFood, an example of this is in in GoFood, we were growing super fast, and we thought we were addressable. Uh, we were uh, uh, capturing the entire food spend of everyone in Indonesia, right? We yeah. thought that was the pie. <laughs> yeah. And then the data keeps growing, 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 and then we realize you you hit certain plateaus, yeah. whereby yes. what we then realize is that oh wait a minute, we are in a particularly middle high economic segment. That was the market yes. Yes. that we were actually, uh, market problem that yes. we were addressing. Yes. Oh, but that's only a subset of that market. Yeah. The larger market must encapsulate the lower levels of the economy. And thus, it was that realization, in order to capture the bigger side of the market, we realized that we had to go down market mm. in terms of cheaper, uh, cheaper SKUs, right? Yes. Uh, things that are more budget sensitive yes. to yep. be able to inc- delivery fee needs to be lower exactly so at that point of stagnation we unleashed it yes. more when we realized that oh actually because everything's black and dark yeah. around here right I mean, in, in a way for, it's like a warcraft when you're first go, starting for out for or go food uh, the segmentation is always much more difficult so whenever you have your whole population as a market yeah. segmentation is a incredibly difficult problem uh, but the best way to think about this is if you have a larger picture which is split into multiple squares, let's say, uh, each square representing one segment, you'll al- your product will almost always start filling, finding product market fit for one segment. Yeah. Right. Then you get into growth phase, you fill that particular square fully and then you're like, oh, I'm not seeing growth. And then yeah. you find the next square. But your current solution does not really work. And the solution is not necessarily features. It is pricing, it is That's incentive, right. it is positioning. Uh, it can be anything. It, it will never, if you don't do anything, it won't move out of that exactly. one square. That's it will the just key. Get stuck. Right? It will get stuck. And this data will tell you that. Yes. The cost of spend, the return on incremental transactions will go up. Yeah. Right? Yes. That's a very important metric exactly. that yeah. people your need to track. Your ROI on your acquisition will keep dropping yes. constantly. Yes. So that's your when ROI you goes find. up. Your cost per incremental transaction goes up, yes. right? Yep. Right. Your ROI goes down, yep. right? And 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 that's when you know, okay, you need to hit that next. You need to get to the new segment. Inflection. Like that can be different yeah. geographies. That can be different. But a segment does not necessarily mean like the example in Go Food that I highlighted. That's mm-hmm. that's a, a different economic segment. Yeah. For example, yes. a segment could be within the same economic class, but a different problem set, like pick up food. I'm just hypothetical now. Yeah, it could be like needs. not the people that need to get food at their location brought to them, but they just want to pick it up. No, That's an example th- th- of an expansion. Um, so either you can increase by geography, you can you can expand, right? So we're talking about how do you get growth. Right. So the way you get growth is by moving into different geographies, or you get growth by addressing a different customer segment altogether. Yeah. Or like which are different people in the same geography, let's say. Or for the same customer, you increase the number of use cases. That let's say people were using it for dinner, what do we need to do to make sure that they use it for lunch as well? Yes. Because the constraint for lunch delivery versus uh, dinner delivery is so different. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people who use uh, who use GoFood for lunch, they are actually in offices. They need to know that the food is going to be deliver, delivered exactly in this particular time. Yes. Uh, they are generally doing orders for an individual whereas the dinner orders tends to be for groups so for the same person who is a loyal dinner go food user might actually never use go food for lunch and always prefers to walk down and how did we figure that out because we hit the limits go food was growing yep. but only for dinner yes yes and we saw a disproportionate amount of growth for lunch yeah and that's when we pivoted 
towards yes. that lunch time and try to build that behavior through shorter delivery time, right? You need your yeah. food fast, yeah. it needs to be more affordable, etc. Yes. So it's faster turnover and so on. And and then it could unleash yeah. the yes. next phase of And in a way we didn't really change any of the features, right? Yeah. What we changed was the pricing. What we actually changed was the selection of uh, restaurants that you see in the morning versus the evening. Uh, those are the things that we selected. It wasn't really any features that we added, and that allowed us to crack one more customer segment. Oh, right. Sorry, one more use need case. for customer. like a need yeah. for the same customer segment. Right. So yeah, I mean the growth comes from all aspects, and you need to make sure that you are not blind to one of the dimensions because in a way moving into a separate geography or acquiring a different customer segment might be far more expensive than deepening your engagement into the existing customer segment. I guess as the last part of this podcast, I, I really wanted to go down to the PM itself <laughs> and what you guys have seen to be uh, the worst characteristics <laughs> of, of like say poor PMs and the best characteristics of the best PMs. PMs are product managers yeah. and a pivotal part of every tech company uh, in the world. Um, they're the ones who actually uh, develop the product in conjunction with the engineering teams. Um, they do a little bit of project management, they do a little bit of research, they do a little bit of marketing, they do a little bit of uh, 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 optimization as well and yeah. analytics, right? So they are that owner of that product. And a product can yep. be something as big as Go Food which yep. is a master product, right? Yep. It can be something as small as the buy button or yep. um, so the way uh, the way I think of best sellers within GoFood. So right? I think of product managers as someone who own a problem, whether it's a GoFood, whether it's just search in GoFood, whether it's just a buy button over there or it is shuffle card over there. It makes no difference. You are owning a problem space. It needs to be well defined problem space, and that's it. Go after it. Sure, as you grow, you take up larger and larger and larger problem spaces. Uh, the good and bad characters on that. Maybe start, maybe it's easier just to focus on the best product managers you know do this. What is this? I think bad the is too easy to define. <laughs> yeah. I think the best product managers actually get the teams to solve the problem. And I don't mean this in a you know regular instead leadership. of themselves. So if you are saying that you are a problem solver, right? I consider uh, design, engineering, UX, QA, uh, research, uh, finance, like depending on the domain expertise that are there. All of these are domain expertise, which are just part of the solution. So if you have a particular problem, let's say that your problem is people are not able to find. Uh, a feature or people are not using a particular feature you can solve that using design you can solve that using engineering you can solve that using incentives mm -hmm. you can actually solve that um, uh, by using user research to understand why people are not using it is it the problem of discovery or is it the problem of no need being there now if as a product manager I try to solve these problems the probability of me solving that problem correctly consistently in a more and more complex space is nil Right? I can do that in the intuitive days, probably. But the job of a product manager is to ensure that all the relevant information is available to all these people. All the people are coming to the table with the right intention to solve that particular problem, have no egos coming in between, are able to exchange ideas and collaborate with each other. Are well, able why to does find. that sound like a CEO's job? Because it it sounds like you just described a CEO it job. It is. It hmm. is. It is, but it's much more focused in a way. Like they are not focused, like, so for a product manager, the aspect of org building is much lower in compared to what it is for a CEO. They're not worry, worried about my operations, my, they're not worried about sales, they're not worried about HR, they're not worried about finance, they're not worried about budget projections, they're not worried about fundraising. Should they be? Uh, I think it's an overkill. I mean, okay. sure, at a certain seniority, yes, they okay. should be. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I would say at that point, they're not really product managers. Right, like product manager manages a product, right? Right, not a company. CEO manages a company, mm. but it's problem solving. So the best product managers bring different different disciplines together, and that group comes up with a solution which blows the product manager's mind. Awesome. What's what in your mind is the most important characteristic of the star <laughs> PMs? So, I would say one of the most important thing is product managers being aware that 
they are not solving for their need they are solving for customers yeah. and then having that ability to build empathy with that customer segment and figuring out what that customer really really wants and then serving those needs that's very important for that the product manager needs to be self critical mm-hmm. like yeah. they need to be aware that oh my first instinct is going to be wrong yeah and be okay with and that and be okay with that and yes. not insecure about it exactly mm-hmm. yeah, you are trying to empathize with a completely new domain and you are trying to do that as fast as possible which means the you are going to make incredibly large amount of mistakes and all of your existing mental models biases for example when you look at incentives of drivers or incentives of merchants they are not similar to a human biases or ins- instincts of a product manager or an engineer mm. right so yeah. so trying to empathize with that fundamentally means you have should be able to say that the way i think is not the way that person thinks and it's okay and mm. hence the best product manager i would say is domain agnostic yes yeah doesn't matter what domain it is like obviously being familiar with the domain helps you form those intuition and it experience does matter but if you take someone what do you mean like domain agnostic what's a domain like food is a domain yeah right now you can move that person the best ones you can move them into pay you can yes. move them into transport yeah. and they would perform just as well i mean they will take time to build up things but they are not they don't say that i'm a pay product manager hmm. like if someone says that oh i manage only payment that fundamentally means they are giving too much inf- credence to their understanding of the payment space in compared to the reality of the market like what happens if the market changes like hmm. would they change right. would their opinions change when they move from one geography to other geography are they trying to impose their understanding of payment space on a completely new country mm. so that i think that's yeah that's that that's what i yeah. meant for me i think the most important characteristic of the best product managers that i know are those that are willing to defend the customer to the bitter end yes yeah. right yep the Absolutely. user whoever the user is the user yes. can be the end user for us it can be merchant merchant it can driver. be drivers whoever that user is they need it to is be the, the user's voice at the table yes yeah. and and willing and having the courage to fight for the customer to the bitter end yeah. that's that would be my criteria i would say that is applicable to every person in the product in the uh, product world. no there is a, there From is different like aspects like designer yes has to do the same thing yes but but i think the product manager needs to be the the one the the yes. one yes. they like need to be the guardian yes. of that yeah. yeah and they need to shield the designers the engineers the 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 all of the, the business analysts etc they need to shield them away from whatever whims the leadership team might have about oh we should go here oh but the business needs to go here no yeah. the best product managers i know shield their product from business needs i would say it is both ways defends the customer to the bitter end i would say it is both ways because even engineers come up with like oh we need to build this for our customers <laughs> yeah right no that's very true yeah. guys thank you so much It's been a very insightful discussion about product a lot of controversial comments <laughs> made a lot of people i know will disagree with us but as always it's been exciting and an honor thanks a lot Absolutely. see you till the that's next podcast thank you thank you yeah All right. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you liked it, please hit like, subscribe and follow us on social media. Thanks so much for tuning in.